Welcome back once again to a little bit of philosophy. This is Philosophy 101, Unit 3, Lecture 3, The Ontological Argument for God's Existence. Now, there are, of course, many different versions of ontological arguments for God's existence, but by far the best known is the one given by St. Anselm of Canterbury in the late 11th century, and that's the one we're going to be focusing on in this video. Now, before we dive into the argument itself, we really need to set the intellectual stage for the argument, and that means a quick look at intellectual history to put Anselm into intellectual context. In order to understand the argument, and some objections to it, we must understand that Anselm is operating in a worldview that was set down in late antiquity. So, we must go back to the late Roman Empire, and acknowledge the revival of Plato's metaphysical view in what we now call Neoplatonism. This revival of classical Greek philosophy was popularized by Plotinus, born in the city of Lycopolis in the Nile Delta of the Roman province of Egypt in the early 3rd century of the Common Era. Around the age of 40, he moved to Rome, where he spent the rest of his life teaching an influential group of disciples, including members of the Roman Senate. His teachings, most notably articulated in a book called the Aeneids, emphasized skepticism toward observable phenomena, holding that knowledge could only be attained by contemplation of the source of all existence, the One. Now, the One is not a being, but rather the source of all being. It cannot be known using the ordinary tools of human reason, but it can be grasped by the soul, which, in some sense, is really just an expression of the One itself. Now, while never as popular as Stoicism in the Roman world, Neoplatonism would become more influential through its adoption as a philosophical foundation of the new religion growing throughout the empire, Christianity. Christianity emerged in the first century in Judea and Asia Minor as a sect of Judaism and gradually spread throughout the pluralistic Roman Empire. It received legal status under the Roman Emperor Constantine in 313, and by 380 it would be made the official cult of the empire by Theodosius I. But prior to its acceptance as a legal cult, Christianity had to compete with a host of other new mystery cults, as well as philosophical movements. It was also subject to sporadic backlash for its exclusivity and secrecy, as well as its rejection of more traditional polytheistic theology. This meant that Christianity evolved in different ways in different parts of the empire, leading to internal squabbles between the leaders or bishops of different Christian communities. In fact, beyond a few shared beliefs like the divinity of Jesus of Nazareth and rituals like the Eucharistic meal, combined with their denial of the existence of other gods, Christianity didn't resemble a single religion so much as a loosely organized group of religions. This meant that as it grew in popularity, the struggle to define exactly what it meant to be Christian was intensified. In response... A group of theologians, known as the Church Fathers, worked to articulate an orthodox or correct set of beliefs and practices that would define the growing cult. One of the most important of these was St. Augustine of Hippo, a Neoplatonist philosopher who converted to Christianity at age 31, Augustine worked tirelessly to defend what he took to be the correct interpretation of Christianity against non-Christians or pagans, as well as competing interpretations of the faith, referred to as heresies. The specific details of these debates aren't important for our story, but what is important is that Augustine's blending of Christianity with his Neoplatonic philosophy would emerge as the dominant or orthodox view of the now official religion of the Roman Empire. There were already a growing set of divisions between the Greek-speaking eastern provinces of the Roman Empire and the Latin-speaking west. This was intensified when Constantine moved the administrative capital to Byzantium to be more centrally located within the empire. But the empire proved to be 
simply too large to administer effectively, and there were various failed attempts to have co-emperors. Co-rulers never really works out very well. There was also an economic disparity between the relatively wealthy eastern provinces and the poorer agrarian western provinces. These divisions would become mirrored in the Christian community, leading to a division between the eastern bishops and those in the west. When the western half of the empire collapsed in 476, nearly 50 years after the death of Augustine, the trajectory of Latin theology would become fixed in the Augustinian mold. The medieval period which followed would see a calcification of the divisions between the East and West, with the Latin Church firmly rooted in the Augustinian traditional views for the next 700 years. By the 7th century, the new religion of Islam would spread east and west out of the Arabian Peninsula and significantly reduce the territory of the fading Eastern Roman Empire, now called the Byzantine Empire. This was the world of St. Anselm in the 11th century. His worldview was Augustinian, and therefore Neoplatonic. This philosophical underpinning will be essential to understanding the metaphysical assumptions that support his ontological argument for God's existence. It's important to note that St. Anselm was not attempting to prove that God exists out of some crisis of faith, as we'll see in the text of the Proslogium itself. No one, Latin, Orthodox, or Muslim, seriously doubted the existence of God. It was an assumed fact. What Anselm is attempting in this far-ranging work is an attempt to examine how far reason could be used to demonstrate what was already believed. It was, in point of fact, an almost purely philosophical exercise to see how far natural reason could carry us in our understanding of God's nature. Now, this exercise would come to be known as natural religion, using the tools of philosophy to explore the nature and existence of God. Ancient philosophers, of course, had provided similar exercises in the course of their work, but in Anselm, we find a revival of this attempt to use reason alone to establish that God exists and clarify our understanding of God's nature. The version of the ontological argument Anselm will develop was to become a classic in this branch of metaphysics. Now, it's important to note that this argument rests on the definition of God that Anselm starts with. Anselm will begin by defining God as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Here we find shadows of Plotinus's one, that which is beyond, that which is the source of all existence. So think of existence. Now think of the greatest possible existence and we're using reason to begin to approach an understanding of God. Now, we can simplify this definition as the greatest conceivable being, or just the GCB. Now, from this definition, Anselm will proceed to demonstrate not merely that God exists, but also that God must exist. So let's go now to the argument, which I've simplified for the sake of clarity. We find in chapter 2 of the Proslogium the definition that will provide the foundation for his ontological argument. Note that he makes clear that he already believes that God exists, and is asking for guidance in demonstrating through an application of reason what he already believes. So this is, again, no crisis of faith. But what about the person who doesn't believe that God exists? The fool, or atheist, denies that God exists, but she certainly understands what we're talking about. This is crucial to the first part of the argument. There's no disagreement about the idea of God, what God is, what the word means. The idea of God is in the mind of the atheist, as is demonstrated in the fact that she understands what's being discussed. The debate is actually over the ontological status of God, not the meaning of the word God. 
Now it's clear that there's a difference between having an idea in one's mind and an understanding that the entity pointed to by that idea exists. So Anselm concludes that the atheist knows that the idea of a greatest conceivable being exists since it already exists in the mind, even the mind of the atheist. But can the atheist be correct in having the idea of God in her mind and simultaneously denying that there exists an entity corresponding to that idea? He concludes that she cannot. This is why the atheist is a fool. She's making a logical error. For if we were to assume that the idea did not point to an actually existing entity, then we could imagine the idea of the greatest conceivable being in two ways, as existing only in the mind, and existing both in the mind and in reality. But since the latter would be greater than the former, a proper understanding of what the greatest conceivable being is demonstrates that it must exist. Now, the first part of Anselm's argument turns on a distinction between what medievalists would have called modes of being or modes of existence. Potential existence refers to anything that's possible, anything that is conceivable. That means anything that does not entail a contradiction. For example, if I try to conceive of a four-sided triangle, I fail. If I try to add the properties of a circle to a square, both ideas are cancelled out. They're mutually exclusive. So we can think of the realm of potentiality as including anything that is conceivable. Dragons are conceivable. Unicorns are conceivable, as are apples and bridges. If you can formulate the idea in your mind, that thing exists in the realm of potentiality. It is a possible being. An actual being, on the other hand, is any conceivable thing that has positive ontological status in the world. That's just a fancy way of saying that it actually exists. Note that actuality does not imply observability or being of, made of matter or having mass. It, it just means that it actually exists in material or non-material form. Remember that as a Neoplatonist, Anselm is a metaphysical dualist, so he would take things like numbers to exist even though they aren't material objects in time and space. So actual existence can apply to both material and non-material entities. Now with this distinction between these two modes of existence firmly in our minds, we can now put Anselm's argument into standard form to clarify it even more. Premise 1. If we conceive of God then God exists potentially. Premise two, we can conceive of God. That is, we understand the idea God when it is conceived. Therefore, God exists potentially. That is, the idea of God exists in our mind or in our understanding. Premise three, if God exists in the mind alone, we could conceive of a being greater than God. Premise four, we cannot conceive of a being greater than God by definition. Therefore, God cannot exist in the mind alone as the atheist claims. God must exist both potentially and actually. Now, we can visualize this argument in the following way. Imagine the set of every conceivable thing. We might think of this as the set of all possible universes. Now contained within the set of potentiality, there will be a subset of things that are not only possible, but also actual. To highlight the difference, let's imagine hobbits. I can conceive of hobbits. They're short, free-footed, pointy-eared, always hungry humanoids. So hobbits exist potentially, but they don't actually exist, so they're not part of the actual universe. 
Now imagine apples. They too are potentially existing things since we can imagine them, but unlike hobbits, apples have positive ontological status. They're part of the actual universe. Now let's return to the debate between Anselm and the atheist. The atheist agrees with the theist that God exists, but only potentially. They understand the idea of the greatest conceivable being, they just don't think of them as actually existing. They think of them more like hobbits, existing only in the realm of potentiality, but not in actuality. Anselm's point, however, is that this is a mistake, and this is precisely what causes them to be a fool. The idea god is not of a being, but rather the greatest possible being. Since it would be greater to actually exist than only potentially exist, the greatest conceivable being must also be an actual being. But Anselm's argument doesn't end there. He goes on in chapter 3 to argue that contained within the idea of the greatest conceivable being is a kind of existence that cannot fail to exist, quite unlike apples. If we fully grasp the meaning of the greatest conceivable being, we find that God cannot not exist. This is because we can distinguish between things that can exist and things that must exist. If we were to try to imagine the greatest conceivable being as a thing that exists at one time but not another, something that can come and go in existence, it's not the greatest conceivable being. In fact, to try to imagine the greatest conceivable being as not existing brings us back to a contradiction. It amounts to mistaking a greatest conceivable being that cannot fail to exist with a being that can fail to exist. But since contradictions aren't even possible, we must conclude that anything that fits the definition of the greatest conceivable being cannot not exist. Now, the second part of Anselm's argument rests on a further distinction between modes of existence or different kinds of existing things. Contingent being is the set of things that can exist but can also not exist. Now, not at the same time, of course, but anything that comes into existence and later ceases to exist would properly be labeled a contingent being. This also applies to its properties. The properties of a contingent being are changeable. I exist, for example, but I haven't always existed. I once had lots of hair, and now I don't. This changeability or alterability of things is in the nature of contingency. Necessary being, on the other hand, is quite different. The existence or properties of something that's necessary are unchangeable. If you should try to add a fourth side to a triangle, you can't. It would cease to be a triangle and would become a rectangle. Being three-sided is a necessary property of triangularity. The two are inseparable. Similarly, the idea of triangle itself just is what it is. It doesn't require thinking to exist. It is a necessary kind of thing. Now, with this distinction between necessary and contingency firmly in mind, we can put the second half of Anselm's argument into standard form. Premise 1. We can conceive of a being existing necessarily or contingently, but not both at the same time. Premise 2. Necessary things are greater than contingent things. Premise 3. God is a necessary thing, by definition, as the greatest conceivable being. Therefore, if God is conceived of as a contingent being, then God would not be God. But of course, it's a contradiction to assert that God isn't God. Therefore, we can't even conceive of God as a contingent being. And therefore, God, the necessary being, must exist. Now, once again, we can visualize this argument by going back to our visualized universes. We previously noted 
that the set of potentiality is like the set of all possible worlds. Now let's add the subsets of contingency and necessity. In a Venn diagram, our circles must always overlap, but as we've already noted, the kinds of things that are contingent will be fundamentally different from the kinds of things that are necessary, so the area of overlap between contingency and necessity is going to be an empty set. We demonstrate that by shading out the overlapping regions between contingency and necessity. So now we have two completely separate sets, the things that are contingent and the things that are necessary, and they share no members in common since the middle section is empty. Now let's bring back in our set of actuality. Note how all three circles are overlapping, and that gives us both distinct as well as shared regions. Our example of hobbits will be useful here. Notice that hobbits are a contingent form of potential being. They could exist, but they don't actually exist. So they're outside the realm of actually existing things. Now, look at the regions of actual and necessary existence. Since every necessary thing must exist, there can't be anything in the region of non-actual necessary things. It's going to be an empty region. So we have to shade that region out as well. Now we clearly see that all necessary things are also actually existing things. Remember, we don't mean physically actually. We just mean that they cannot not exist, whatever their ontological makeup turns out to be. But what about this region? It would indicate the existence of actual things that aren't necessary and also not contingent. But that's not possible either, so we'll have to shade out this region as well. Now, there are only three regions remaining. The non-actual contingent, the actual contingent, and the necessary actual. Since a necessary being would be greater than a contingent one, this is where the greatest conceivable being must be located on the diagram. So not only is it foolish to assert that God exists in the mind alone, it's impossible to imagine it. Anselm has argued that if one understands what a greatest conceivable being is, they will also understand that it would be impossible for it to fail to exist. The greatest conceivable being will have to be a necessary being. So there it is. God's existence has been demonstrated. Now there are, as you might expect, objections to Anselm's argument, and we'll start with one that actually came in his own lifetime. Having read Anselm's Proslogium, Guinillo of Montmontier wrote a rebuttal entitled On Behalf of the Fool, where he attempts to reduce Anselm's argument to absurdity. By adopting the analogical substitution instance of the greatest conceivable island, he hopes to show that Anselm's argument is flawed, even if he couldn't exactly put his finger on the fallacious inference. When we apply the substitution of the greatest conceivable island for the greatest conceivable being, we get the following argument. Premise 1. If we conceive of a greatest conceivable island, then a greatest conceivable island exists, potentially. We can conceive of a greatest conceivable island. Therefore, a greatest conceivable island exists potentially. If the greatest conceivable island exists in the mind alone, we could conceive of an island greater than the greatest conceivable island. But of course we can't conceive of an island greater than the greatest conceivable island by definition. Therefore, the greatest conceivable island cannot exist in the mind alone, and it must therefore exist both in the mind, that is potentially, as well as actually. But Anselm didn't buy Guinillo's argument and wrote a rebuttal. What Anselm points out, quite correctly, is that an island, 
even the greatest conceivable island we can imagine, unspoiled by human discovery, is not the kind of thing he's talking about, because an island, any island, is a contingent kind of thing. After all, what makes an island an island is the fact that it's a body of land surrounded by water. Take away the water, and the island ceases to be an island. Guinello's counterexample only applies to the first half of the ontological argument. If Anselm had stopped at chapter 2, Guinello would have a point. But, since he goes on in chapter 3 to lay out the second half of the argument, which shows that the greatest conceivable being must be a necessary thing, it takes the sting out of the objection. Or, to put it as Anselm himself does, quote, if you can adopt my sequence of reasoning to anything, I'll give you your lost thing, never to be lost again. So much for Guinello. But there are other objections which can be made to the ontological argument as we have it in Anselm. As we noted at the beginning of this video, Anselm is operating within a platonic metaphysical framework. But what if that framework is incorrect? Why should we take actual existence to be greater than potential existence. Further, why should we consider necessary existence greater than contingent existence? To understand Anselm's metaphysical assumptions, we need to remember that Plato divides the universe into two categories, being and becoming. The realm of being is that part of the universe that is conceivable, and the realm of becoming is the part of the universe that's perceivable. His famous divided line analogy from Book 6 of The Republic gives us clear insight into Plato's metaphysical hierarchy. Images are copies of objects, and objects are copies of universals, which in turn are copies of being itself. You can't have an image of a thing without the thing to be copied. The thing, the image, is ontologically dependent on the object that it's an image of. Similarly, he held that objects can't exist without the ideas of that object, so a particular rose is just a material copy of the idea, or the universal, flower. The universal has ontological priority over the material copy. And since all the things that fall into the realm of being are necessary, and all the things that fall into the realm of time and space are contingent, all contingent reality is ontologically inferior to what is necessary. Given that Anselm's point of view presupposes Plato's ontological hierarchy, it would be true that necessary things are greater than contingent things. But what if Plato is wrong? His student Aristotle certainly thought he was, at least on this particular point. He turns Plato's ontology on its side, opting for a horizontal as opposed to vertical hierarchy. The most basic realities in the universe, according to Aristotle, are what he called primary substances, or first things of philosophical analysis. Individual horses, or individual birds, or individual humans, roses, stones, and planets would all be examples of primary substances. Those individual things can be organized and compared to each other because they are examples of kinds of things, or secondary substances, the universals in other words. And universals can be organized together by kind to form the distinction between species and genera, but they are all secondary substances. They're all universals. Now, there are two important points to draw from Aristotle's ontological view. First, you can't compare a thing of one kind with a thing of another kind. You can compare one horse to another horse and ask which is better at being a horse, but it makes no sense to ask whether a horse is better than a bird. That would be a category mistake. They're just different kinds of things. So thinking about Plato's divided line, there's no reason to think a painting is somehow less real than the landscape it depicts. A painting is a different kind of thing than the landscape, and so they're not metaphysically comparable. 
The second important point to draw from Aristotle's view is that universals are not higher than primary substances. In fact, his secondary substances do not exist independently from primary substances. Aristotle is not a dualist in the sense that his teacher Plato was. And if universals don't exist independently from the material world, there's no sense in which they can be more real or ontologically prior to any primary substance. So if we were to adopt an Aristotelian metaphysical view, we would probably not be willing to conclude that actual existence is greater than potential existence, or that necessary existence is greater than contingency. And without these assumptions, Anselm's argument becomes unsound. Of course, Anselm didn't have access to Aristotle's metaphysics. Plato was all he had at that point in history. A final objection we should consider to Anselm's ontological argument was put forward in the 18th century by the German idealist philosopher Immanuel Kant. He points out that any claim about existence must be a synthetic, not an analytic claim. So to claim that God exists cannot be analytically true in the way that Anselm, and of course later René Descartes, claims. An analytic statement is any claim whose predicate term is contained within the subject term, while a synthetic claim, on the other hand, is one where the predicate term is not contained within the subject term. For example, the claim that triangles are three-sided would be analytic because three-sidedness is contained in the subject triangularity. But if I said this triangle is blue, I would be making a synthetic claim because blue is not a necessary part of the idea of triangle. In fact, no color attribution would be necessary to the idea of triangle. I can imagine one absent of any color at all. Now that we have this distinction in mind, we can more clearly understand Kant's objection to the ontological argument. It would be an analytic claim to say that God is the greatest conceivable being, since that's just what the idea God means. However, if we say that God exists, we would be making a synthetic claim, since all claims about actuality are matters of fact, not matters of logic. It would be analytically true that God is omnipotent and omniscient if God exists. Those are necessary properties contained within the idea God, but whether something exists or doesn't exist is not a matter of logic and therefore cannot be established analytically. That's not to say that Kant didn't believe in God or that God's existence can't be rationally inferred. He just didn't think an a priori argument, like the ontological argument given by St. Anselm, could ever possibly work. To summarize, the ontological argument attempts to demonstrate the existence of God a priori from an examination of the idea of God. The most famous version, but certainly not the only version, was given by St. Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century of the Common Era. Anselm's argument rests on the metaphysical views of Plato, synthesized with Christianity by St. Augustine, which dominated the majority of the medieval worldview due to the collapse of the western half of the Roman Empire in the 5th century. Anselm's argument works from the definition of God as the greatest conceivable being, and attempts to show that God is both an actually existing entity and also a necessary one. Finally, we briefly considered three objections to Anselm's argument, and while he was easily able to counter one of them, he was simply not able to fathom the others, given the limitations of the historical context in which he lived. Aristotle's metaphysics wouldn't be available in Western Europe for another hundred years, and Kant's careful distinction between analytic and synthetic statements wouldn't be available for another 700 years. But we find in St. Anselm's work the revival of the ancient Greek tradition of applying reason to questions about God's nature and existence, which would become a central part of philosophical metaphysics for the next 700 years. Thanks for watching.
and look for more videos on the philosophy of religion as we continue to learn a little bit of philosophy. See you next time.